Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to stand on the protocol already established by my dean, Professor Kofi Abuchi, and proceed with the introduction of our speaker for today. Our speaker today is a finance and economic policy analyst and a successful entrepreneur with a passion for public policy advocacy and thought leadership. He is publicly known for exploits in the petroleum sector as the founding CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. He is credited for his leadership as managing trustee of the COVID-19 private sector fund and project lead in the development of Ghana's first infectious disease center. An ultra-modern and well-equipped facility delivered in a record time of less than 100 days. He has been a key driver in the conceptualization and development of many major economic policies in the country, including the development of the Energy Sector Levies Act and its consequential debt structuring solutions in the form of energy bonds to resuscitate our energy sector. His impact has made him one of the few persons to serve as a ministerial advisor to successive governments, the NDC and the NPP. He serves on various public and private boards. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is the first recipient of the Citizen Experience Award granted by the Ghana Customer Experience Professionals. He is a member of the African Leadership Magazine Hall of Fame for his corporate successes and a multiple award winner at Ghana's Energy Awards and Ghana's Business Awards. As a global thought leader, he has been a speaker at various international conferences, including the African Development and Investment Conference and the African Leadership Magazine Conferences sharing platforms with African presidents. He holds an MBA in finance and an MA in economic policy management, as well as undergraduate degrees in psychology and philosophy. He is married with two children. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver a lecture today on the theme, avoiding the impending death of the 1992 constitution, I'm privileged to present to you Mr. Senor Hosi. Thank you very much, um, Gertrude. I hope you can hear me. I need to hold the mic. Quite a humbling introduction. Quite confusing for me, though. Special guests of honor, Honorable Chairman Sabunsu, Honorable Dominic, uh, Dr. Dominic Ajini, representing the Minority Leader, Chairperson of the NCC, Auntie Mine, Elizabeth Ohene, um, my pastor to here, Reverend Whitcomb. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I commit no sins, and may you pray for me, right? I humbly, for want of time, would want to ride on existing protocols. I want to start off by saying a big thank you to the UPSA Law School and um, the One Ghana Movement Board for the courage in nominating me, a very layman, to deliver this year's Constitution Day public lecture. I, at my last check, I, I had nothing like a law degree whatsoever in my academic bios. But I have been very, very content pursuing a career that has had significant impact on the delivery of public goods and services. With degrees in economic policy management, finance, psychology, and philosophy, as shared earlier, from the only university I can call mine, the University of Ghana. <laughs> I know you know why. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my nomination is actually no. There's actually no knock on any person considered more qualified for a day like this, nor a knock on the legal fraternity. But it actually is a definite knock on the hedging stereotypical thinking that has long held our public space hostage 
and validated some perceptions of constitution capture by lawyers and politicians. The constitution is no abstract construct, analyzable and decodable by a few. It is the codification of what and how we, the people, seek to live and achieve in the governing of self as a sovereign. A constitution enjoys a very, very special place in the entire life of a nation. It is the fundamental law of the land, serving as a prime document for public policy and impacting all facets of life and society. It is a reflection of the socioeconomic and sociopolitical aspiration of we the people, and not just a given profession. In the landmark ruling, 2-4 versus Attorney General, reported in the 1980 Ghana Law Report. You can imagine what work I've been doing the last two weeks. <laughs> Our former Chief Justice, EMP Soa, situates the Constitution so effectively when he posits, I quote, a written constitution such as ours is not an ordinary act of parliament. It embodies the will of the people. It also mirrors their history. Account, therefore, needs to be taken of it as a landmark in a people's search for progress. It contains within it their aspirations and their hopes for a better and fuller life. Underline that, end quote. Constitutions organize the basic structures of governance the distribution of political power, regulation of the intricate relationships between the political organs and the relationship between the government and us, the governed. It is the fundamental basis for determining how we eat, how we live, build our wealth, make meaning of work. And as Professor Raymond Atukuba explains in his remarkable piece, if the constitution, we go job. The Constitution ensures an equitable distribution of our natural resources. The Constitution is so powerful that it needs all laws to be consistent with it. Inferring from Chief Justice Sowers ruling, it means that every law in this country must match the aspirations and will of the people or simply forget it. Distinguished guest, all that I have stated about our constitution represent no veiled attempt to appear to sound legalese, nor impose on you a sense that I belong to this very revered and reclusive group of people with white wigs. <laughs> Court lawyers, I pray you change your wigs though. <laughs> Black men don't have white, gray, Caucasian hair. I say these things so eruditely about our constitution because it is a fact that this constitution, if you like, is what the Italians will call the Totorina, or the Dagombes will call the Palinpa, and we the Elwes will call the Sobolisa. These remarks, ladies and gentlemen, underlie or really underscore the importance of, a, of, of the constitution and how a document, no more than just brilliant pages of calligraphy, rules our lives. It is critical to note that despite the excessive political or politicization and partisan fanaticism that engulfs our governance systems today, every president, judge, minister, parliamentarian, or public officer, soldier, police, swears allegiance to none other than the Constitution. But why so? Why not to the people? It is so because the citizenry they are to serve are the object of the Constitution. In other words, you and me and the well-being of all of us as a citizenry is the reason for us having a Constitution. So if you care about yourself, you care about your progress and that of your kid and kin, you should surely be caring about the Constitution. So, in agreement with Professor Atuguba, na Constitution we for job. So I call on all Ghanaians, from my rice farmers in Weta and Adakru, to the fisher folks in Ododododio, the market woman in KJTR, Aze, the Takradi man, Osei, the mechanic in Swami, Aku, the Kayayu, Idrisu, that teacher in Tamale, and Brakofi, for sure, that German burger from Brikum, <laughs> to own the constitution and seize their space in shaping 
the trajectory of the development of the Ghanaian constitution. The constitution is about us, and it is for all of us. So with your permission, as the accounts will say, to the topic. When the topic was first suggested, it understandably provoked controversy. How could Ghana's longest serving constitution revere for creating the current governance structures, which has delivered the longest period of uninterrupted political governance, be presented as a document in hopeless atrophy? To put it mildly, a document on its last legs. Some friends have actually been more mischievous in suggesting that I would definitely be a person of interest for the National Investigative Bureau for trying to suggest the impending death of our 1992 constitution. But I am hopeful that for an exercise with such tremendous puritanical and noble intentions for the preservation of our republic, a jail cell will not be my abode tonight. I shall go back to the warmth of my wife. Patrick Mago, one in an article published in the Journal of Modern African Studies, indicates that Sub-Saharan um, Africa experienced 80 successful coups and 108 failed coup attempts between 1956 and 2001, an average of four a year. This average halved in the period from 2001 to 2019 as most African countries um, moved towards democracy. The BBC reports that in 2021 alone, Sub-Saharan Africa has now seen a resurgence of coups with six in the bag. This unsettling observation raises one big question. Why? But Remy Adekoye, a political analyst and associate lecturer at York University in the UK, he answers this so succinctly in a publication on CNN. And he puts it this way, different decade, same problems. Just as we saw the case in the early post-colonial decades when coups were rampant, Africa's 2021 coup leaders justify toppling governments and constitutions with allegations of corruption, mismanagement, social injustice, tyranny, and poverty. These reasons are similar to those advocated by the coups of Ghana's past. We must all be reminded that just as citizens stormed the streets to jubilate over the success of its coups, the 2021 successful coups in Sub-Saharan Africa have also been met with jubilations. More from the youth. The Arab Spring of 2010 should not be lost on anyone. It is a reminder of the ability of the citizenry to pursue a restoration of the aspirations captured in the constitution whose people are the repository of sovereignty. I call this the people's restoration or the civilian coup. The justifications by the uprising youth in the Arab Spring are similar to the military hunters of yesteryears and today. Distinguished guests, the 1992 constitution effectively captures the essence of its being in the first part of its preamble. And I quote, we the people of Ghana, in exercise of our natural and inalienable right to establish a framework of government, we shall secure for ourselves the po and posterity the blessings of liberty, equality of opportunity, and prosperity, unquote. This shares clearly what the goal of our constitution is, a document to assure the citizenry, its youth, and generations unborn, an aspiration for liberty, equality of opportunity, and for prosperity. The terrifying portion of this section is the instructive power of the words shall and secure. It suggests a demand on the operators, a big, big demand, for the constitution to ensure of the constitution to ensure certainty in the delivery of the listed blessings for this constitution to sustain its relevance and meaning. The preamble also defines the values that should guide how we, the people, and government pursue the delivery of the promised blessings. It mentions these: freedom, justice probity, accountability, and also mentions unity. The question we will be interrogating today will be whether and how the 1992 constitution and the actions of its operators, you and I seated here, 
deliver on the demands of the blessings and values. I am convinced that if the actors of the constitution enabled by the nature of its framing deplete hope, I repeat, hope, for we the people to realize the assured blessings of liberty, equality of opportunity, and prosperity, the 92 constitution shall lose its luster and inevitably lose its last leg, which is us, the people. And this will happen with thousands of youth who are today about 70% unemployed or underemployed calling for his demise. Unfortunately, I can't say it any better. The clock is ticking. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Do not be disturbed by my bluntness in some form of doom I seem to suggest. I assure you of my unreserved belief in democracy. In my opinion, it is the best option we can hope for. I, however, hold firmly that no governance system is one size fits all. Democracy must, however, be adapted to fit our circumstances. I call that a ganocracy. In the referred to four versus attorney general case, Justice Sowa again ruled that, and I quote, the constitution is a living organism capable of growth and development as the body politic of Ghana itself is capable of growth and development, end quote. This tells us that the democracy of any sovereign is sustainable and potent only to the extent of its flexibility to the evolving circumstances culturally and developmentally of its people. If our democracy is less ganocratic and more americratic, I assure you, we are headed for doom. In this lecture, I shall be arguing that the current framework of the 1992 Constitution has enabled its operators to plunge us into easily into a, a spiral of misgovernance in a manner that is fast depleting the hope of we, the people, realizing the promise of liberty, equality of opportunity, and prosperity. I shall further argue that this spiral of misgovernance, spared by the non-conformity to the values of this Constitution, is birthing the very environment and justification for the death of constitutions preceding the 1992 constitution. The lecture shall argue that at core, people seek the operation of governance systems that deliver their aspirations and not necessarily share some addiction to democracy. The lecture shall share some perspectives on the functionality and constraints of the governance institutions key to ensuring the effective performance of government, governments in pursuit of our, our aspirations as a citizen. In direct response to the topic, this lecture shall proffer revisions and amendments to our governance frame and the 1992 constitution in a bid to, what, to avoid what it deems the impending death of the constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, I will at outset want to reflect briefly on some of the successes of our 92 constitution. It is undoubtedly the bedrock of Ghana being an icon of political stability in sub-Saharan Africa. We seem to be an oasis of peace in a political region still recovering from the scars of debilitating insurrections that serve as a chilling reminder of our inglorious past. Often, Ghana's reality is projected as an expertly managed transition from the turbulence of military rule to a political culture whose byproducts have now become what the sustained periods of democracy, democratic rule, democratic consolidation, and political stability. Recall that within a relatively short period of 45 years, 1957 to 1992, our nation promulgated about, promulgated and abrogated four constitutions. Within the same period, the military also put in place six constitutive instruments of governance in the form of proclamations. We remember the thorough consultative process built into the search for the 92 constitution by the, G, the Justice D.F. Annan of Blessed Memory led National Commission for Democracy and Committee of Experts. I always saw that man as a fine gentleman. The rigors and inclusiveness of the process and the hindsight of failure furnished by the previous constitutions combined to crystallize into the current constitution that has lasted us three decades. May, I think, will be exactly three decades. 
It is commendable that the leaders of the time found it wise to involve many relevant groupings and profession, professions. Market women, of course, the pastors were there. Our national leaders were there. We had um, farmers, fisher folks, hairdressers, who the lawyers had problems with. I mean, I, I actually had a portion for them, but I've taken it out because I don't want to be on the front page tomorrow. We also had teachers, engineers in there. I'm happy to hear that Uncle Sam regrets the acts of the Ghana Baos Association at the time for feeling that they were not fit to be in the same room with hairdressers. Those who did this constitution and those framers, I congratulate them conceptually in structure because they realized the essence of a constitution was the people and worked so hard in making sure that in the drafting process it was as inclusive as possible. Distinguished guest, the legal fraternity often highlights 3 4, section, Article 3 4 of the Constitution in particular, for its magic wand in suppressing the appetite for coups. Permits me to double in a little of legalese again. And I quote that portion All citizens of Ghana shall have the right and duty at all times to do all in their power to restore their, this Constitution after it has been suspended, overthrown, or abrogated. End quote. Clause 5 of the article, of course, offers some non-prosecutorial guarantees to any citizen of the republic who resists the, the overthrow of, or the abrogation of this constitution. In fact, the provision says that no offense is committed in that process at all. So we all have to defend this constitution if it's ever abrogated. And if you are arrested in that process, nobody can really hold you for treason. When we get the constitution back, you are safe. Ladies and gentlemen, I can only partially agree with this widely held view that, the singular co uh, that, that this singular clause has fiercely served as a disincentive for coups since 1993. First, I think that claim is an, is an exaggeration. It perceives coups as being only military and forgets that the will of the people can go against their own former will. Secondly, it belittles the intelligence of our men in uniform who have undergone a lot of transformations and orientations since the 1980s. However, as the evidence bears, I unreservedly agree that one legacy of the 1992 constitution is that it has given us political stability. This is important because between 1960 and 1990, it was the most sought after commodity. But ironically, ladies and gentlemen, this is where my problems with the constitution begins. The delivery of political stability in the past 30 years is no assurance of stability in the next five years, 10 years, 20, or another 30 years. Just in case we may have forgotten, there once was a company called Kodak and a phone called Blackberry. It was unthinkable in their prime that an end was certain, but the unthinkable happened. And this happened because they remained locked up in their success and failed to effectively estimate the future to adapt in time to sustain their relevance. What sure is permanent in life is the evolution of change in time. As Justice Sowa rightly pointed in the 2-4 versus Attorney General case, the Constitution contains within it the aspirations and hopes of the citizenry for a better and fuller life. I opine that the enduring stability from a constitution lies in its ability to sustain the hope for a better and fuller life. And in our case, the blessings and values promised in the preamble of the 1992 constitution. We cannot take our political stability for granted. So we must ask, are we delivering on the promise of liberty, equality of opportunity, and prosperity? Are we living the values of freedom, justice, probity, accountability, and unity? If not, then the bigger question must be asked. Are we eroding hope? It's a major word in this lecture. Hope that we will deliver? If yes, then for sure the death of this constitution may well be nigh. I would now proceed to share my assessment and position on the above questions. So ladies and gentlemen, let's start briefly with the promised blessings. 
We can start with liberty. We have delivered, for example, um, freedom to form maybe part of any legal social grouping, freedom of movement. There are a lot of liberties we, 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 can, we can point to. To that extent, one may assume that we have delivered on, on liberty. But this is misleading. Under the operation of this constitution, we have seen many discriminated against in the access to public goods and services. In the last reigns of President Rawlings, it was public knowledge that getting contracts required you to have a party card. The same was the case under President Kofu. And interestingly, many a Ghanaian businessman had NDC and MPP cards. Ghana is beautiful. <laughs> I don't think much has changed. Today, when arguments are advanced over issues of policy, we focus more on the messenger than the message. The common refrain, refrain forget our guy. He's from this party or that party. He's not one of us. Look, whether we admit it or not, your association with a political grouping or not affects your economic and, in some cases, your social liberties. These are open truths. So I do not believe that we have and are delivering well enough on our promise of liberty. Our liberty is in speaking only in the mundane. We easily exercise political and social power against persons considered non-aligned to our political interest. Criticize a government fiercely, no matter how constructive it is, and see how the machinery of state, from regulators to the security services, Yoko and the GRA may come after you. I have suffered it both ways. Unfortunately, I will not join the wagon of hypocrisy and pretend that we do not live in a town where common sense has not even become a matter of NDC and MPP. Respectfully, even our members of parliament who are to represent us, and I recognize the chief whip. I salute you, sir. <laughs> our own people who are supposed to represent us, the people, they swear their allegiance to the constitution not to their party, constitution. They lose their liberties to reason on their own and act in our interest, but rather as directed by their respective parties, irrespective of whose parochial interest a party is advancing. How many of them are bold and competent enough to hold their own against the stance of their party or their president? Try and see. <laughs> If in doubt, as the majority and minority leader, I salute you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> as the two of them, if they can agree to have the E levy bill passed by a secret vote, <laughs> and we all know that if it wasn't a secret vote, there's no way Abangbabe will be in the office. So we are looking for that mole. I don't know if you found him, but if you found him, give me your address. I'll deal with him myself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's look at the issue of equality of opportunity. How can we suggest any success at equality of opportunity where many of our youth have it so evident that whom you know has become more important than what you know and who you are in getting employment and access to educational scholarships? We every day shatter the hope of Kwame in team, the plantain farmer in Lolobi, to have his son gainfully employed after selling half of his farm estate to educate his son at UPSA. Our government sector jobs from ministries to state-owned enterprises have now become overwhelmed with the term protocol. You need to be well-connected politically or socially to stand a good chance. What at all are we teaching these youth with this culture, we are replacing merit and hard work and patron with patronage, privilege, and political fanaticism. I had to suffer with this word. I hope I'm pronouncing it well. My wife is my English teacher. She has no mercy. And we will be tired if you go and say something like that in front of my auntie daily. You might as well think twice. What for me is really frightening now is how this culture is overwhelming our security services we will soon have, if we already don't, 
an NDC and MPP silent faction of security services. Let's be honest about it. Our politicians pride themselves as one of their achievements in getting their people into this service and that service. It's part of the KPIs of an MP. I have seen firsthand the party caucuses that are evolving in our state-owned enterprises, regulatory bodies, and educational system. It is terrible and terrifying. The same is true in contracts for public goods and services. We now have MPP and NDC businessmen. Each goes into hibernation when in opposition or repackage themselves as subcontractors to the new political business persons. When we look also, ladies and gentlemen, at our economic inequality indices, it is very telling. The Gini index, which is used to assess, assess um, economic inequality, shows that inequality has worsened from a 33.4 coefficient in 1994 to 43.5 as of 2018. Inequality worsened by 30%. I'm quite confident if we get our latest data, it will be worse. Distinguished guests, it is no surprise that the rural urban migration is increasing. Our urban population has increased from 50.9% to 56.7% in 2021. 50.9% in 2010. In absolute terms, this is an increase of 4.9 million people, equivalent to 80% of the total population increase since 2010. This tells us that our, de our decentralization policies are failing and the pursuit of a better and fuller life is not being found in the rural areas. Where is the equality of opportunity? Even in our justice system, there is no equality. If you like, commoners steal their goods and instead of reform, rot in jail. But big man in Ghana, loot depositors' funds in a bank and get to still live large and even get the chance to blow tons on national television. Snatch a ballot box as a commoner. No, actually, snatch a ballot paper as a commoner. You will definitely make the front page and rot in jail. But, you know, be called honorable. Snatch a ballot box, a paper, at the center of our democracy, parliament of all places, and be hailed as the prince of your party. After three decades of a constitution that has advocated the quality of opportunity and demands governments to ensure full integration of women into the mainstream of the economic development of Ghana, our public sector remains dominated by men who account for 60% of the public sector workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, our entire public system is every day being shattered by partisan politics and the disregard for meritocracy. The fastest way these days to rise, I mean, is to paint every other person as a sympathizer of an opposition party. You get your promotion quick. But woe betides you if the sound of your name confirms it even more. Under the NDC, I was called a Mo. Under the MPP, I was called an Igbe man for sure. I'm proud to be an Igbe man and also the son of a gang woman. We are who we are. Let's assess ourselves for who we are. Our public service is riddled with so much disappointment and no meaning of hard work and good service anymore. I serve and work so hard to grow through the ranks, and some party faithful gets appointed as my boss. I will have to teach him everything and practically do his job to even hold on to my current position. How do you expect these public officers to feel and commit their all? We are simply nurturing bitterness. We are promoting political fanaticism in a public and civil service that must not be partisan. 
Ladies and gentlemen, after 30 years of this constitution, it is unbelievable that we still have schools under trees, and yet politicians pride themselves with the status, status symbol of the latest V8 vehicles. It is obvious that our governance system can easily V8, but for the downtrodden, struggle to elevate. How many of our well-to-do political elites pontificating over the public education system educate their wards in our public schools? I am a proud product of Pantan Hospital School. When I left there three decades ago, and Pantan is a proper site too, just in case you don't understand. It was in a way better state than I saw it last year when I visited it. Roofs leaking, very dirty walls, all science infrastructure gone, with over 70 kids in a class designed for about 25. I could not help but weep. These kids would have to compete one day with my children and the children of many of our political and business elites who attend the international premium private schools. Where is the quality of opportunity? If those to lead in the change of our fortunes do not believe in the system, they should pretend over enough to school their offsprings there. Where is our hope? Can anyone show me which of our past fourth Republican presidents school their children in our public universities? These uncomfortable truths speak volumes to the investment of our leaders in the country they lead. Ladies and gentlemen, needless to say, when our presidents, the advisors, speakers of parliament, and many of our political and elite are ill, they jump on the next available flight so quickly at the expense of Mamiya Adili's taxes to get the finest of care, even for routine checkups sometimes. It's not everybody, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> when Mami Adili is ill, she must contend with the pathetic state of our health facilities and the ever-stretched and wanted medical staff right here in Ghana. The symbolism of the surgical ward at Kulebu, I wish I took a picture and put it on this screen. Ghana's foremost hospital is a chilling reminder of the failing hope of many in the capacity of this constitution to deliver goods and services fairly to all. So you tell me, where is the quality of opportunity? Where is the hope of its delivery? Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let's now turn to prosperity. The matters of concern survey undertaken by the NCCE has each time highlighted employment, education, and health as the primary matters of concern to the Ghanaian citizens. On education, we have observed a decrease from 23.4% to in 2010 to 20.8% in 2021 in the proportion of our population that has never attended school. This definitely is some progress, but definitely not what we wish for. While we do commend efforts like FQ, free SHS, to promote school enrollment, the real question is about the quality of education. Schooling the population is primarily towards an end of making them economically and socially viable in a global world that is fast shrinking. They must be productive and employable. Reading and writing are key, but the foremost concern of majority of our graduates, if we have some here, what is the foremost priority after school? Employment. We look at the employment data and it is frightening. If this doesn't scare you, I don't know what in the world is. You can't even be scared of the devil. <laughs> the statistical service reports the unemployment rate among the youth. It's 15 to 35 years. It's 19.7%. Young adults, 15 to 24 years, 32.8%. Wait. The World Bank reports that 50% of the youth are underemployed. Bundle both together, you have about 70% of our youth unemployed or underemployed. And if you understand how employment data is captured, you realize that for our circumstances, this is even an understatement. This is dangerous and it is scary. The youth today cannot be held responsible for this melancholic world we have given them. 
They are bearing the brunt of our actions and indiscretions over the last 30 years. That's the world we have given them. Ladies and gentlemen, our finances and our ability to drive growth through government investments have been dwindling. Despite the many borrowings made by successive governments, the economic productivity of these spendings is yet to be realized. We have grown our public debt from 4.5 billion to about 60 billion dollars. 4.5 billion in 92, about 60 years at last year. Our revenue to GDP ratio is still worrisome and depressing. Our wages and interest payments, or what employee compensation and interest payments, account for 95% of our total domestic revenue. Tell me what is really left to invest sustainably in infrastructure and programs to stimulate a long-term turnaround. In fact, what at all is the economic strategy known by the people to turn things around? Sometimes it feels like we are living by the day under some autopilot of, of, of grace. That's why it's in Ghana. Heart is a manager. Everybody's a manager. Some you don't know how you get by, but you get by. God is good. Bless you, yourself. <laughs> When a government needs to dip its hands into your digital wallet after you have paid your taxes, even when you are paying your chop money, then you should know that we have a crisis we must solve together. If you don't understand the economic squad, this one you should understand. Why are we failing to discuss cutting down our many expenditures that continue to prove unproductive? How come a country so small and obviously so broke opts to keep a government so big? 275 parliamentarians said, please, somebody should advise the EC not to try anything, anything funny again. And over 100 ministers, with only God knows how many staffers and special assistants, with everyone feeling entitled to a V8 and a business class travel, if debt distressed Ghana was a company, our leaders, NDC, MPP, were running as shareholders and managers, I wonder if we would be superintending the waste and inefficiencies and pillage as we have seen under the 92 Constitution. The things we do under this Constitution, many of us won't do to our own selves. Let's be honest about it. We have failed to develop a common economic agenda and render the NDPC a white elephant, replacing each national de development plan with the party manifesto. Rawlings' vision 2020 gave way to Kofor's vision 2010, then a 40-year development plan under Mahama that has been denounced, if I'm not mistaken. I hope we have another one coming because we need one. This ping pong we play with the economic policies is heartbreaking. We seem to have forgotten that we are dealing with real lives. The lack of a true national agenda is reflective of the adversarial democracy we have developed from the Constitution. If we had a more consensual process in developing any of these plans, we won't be here. We won't be here. The adversary must stop. It is an NDC MPP war on who gets credit and whose face will be printed on the document. And as the elephant and the umbrella fight over the absurdity of ego, you, me, and that little girl Amina, the 10-year-old class 5 girl in Bumprugu Yoyo, will continue to suffer. We have good land good weather, natural and human resources, and yet we are hungry and broke. How? <laughs> Corruption, poor leadership, and wastage inspired by the governance frame of this constitution, which yields close to no accountability. So let's see. Let's imagine the United Arab Emirates 
announcing it is offering citizenship for 2 million Ghanaians through a process to be hosted at the Craspo Stadium. Charlie, what do you think? <laughs> I, I don't think I need to tell you the stampede that is sure to happen. Half of May 9th, just forget it. It will be child's play. I do not think I have to tell you that. The United Arab Emirates has shared prosperity for its citizens, even though it is not a democracy. The UAE is a democracy of five people. No, seven people. I am sure most of us are, from time to time, salivate at the opportunity of annual vacations there. Just so we are reminded, the desert called UAE is ranked 21st in the happiness, World Happiness Index, while Ghana, Democratic Ghana ranks 98th. Ladies and gentlemen, I opine that people at core seek dignity and prosperity in living fuller lives for themselves and their children much more than an addiction to democracy. Now, democracy, they go chop. So, my verdict. Have we delivered on the blessings? I conclude, no. Are we depleting hope that we will deliver? I'd like to make a few remarks before then. Every time we have been faced with bad governance, we have been patient to see the end of the government's reign in hope that the next will be well. A lie? Uh -huh. I don't know whether it's yes or no. <laughs> but after trying both NDC and MPP four times each at elections, many are beginning to feel very disappointed and are concluding that it's almost the same wine in different bottles. This is the honest fact. My problem in life is that what you say in your room, I advertise it in public <laughs> with my face on it. God forgive me. I hope I can go home today. My wife warned me, but I didn't listen. The recent survey by the CDD that showed that over 70% of Ghanaians prefer having MMDC's election on a non-partisan basis is very telling. Of the sentiments that we, the people, are beginning to have about partisan politics, why should we be rejecting it down there? If we've been doing it up there, we are happy. So my answer, if I may use my friend's terminology, enkoye la pa, enkoye, it is not going well. We are depleting the hope and we are depleting it fast. So the question arises, why has the separation of powers and the democratic institutions set up by the 92 constitution failed to ensure the delivery of the promised blessings? I call this the sham of separation. Ladies and gentlemen, the suggestion that we have separation of powers is to serve as a check in governance toward the delivery of these aspirations in the Constitution is almost a sham. It exists in form, but not in practice. Truth. We have an ever powerful presidency that appoints 50% of ministers from parliament and has the power to appoint them on board. In fact, my very good friend and uncle, um, Honorable Chairman Monsu, is actually a cabinet minister. The judiciary, on the other hand, is significantly dependent on the executive for its appointments, thereby creating prospects of political and executive activism. Everybody wants to catch the eye of the president. Everybody. This incestuous relationship between the executive, parliament, and judiciary makes it extremely difficult to ensure proper checks and accountability in our governance frame. The presidency also holds appointing authority over the democratic institutions of state like the NCC, the Electoral Commission, Shraj, NMC. He appoints the leaders or it, the presidency appoints the leaders and board members of accountability institutions like the Attorney General, Auditor General, Office of Special Prosecutor, IOKO. He appoints everybody. <laughs> All the way to our districts and municipalities. In most cases, there are, there's no security of tenor for these appointees. And where there is, the economic pest of the institution rests in the bosom of the president through his minister of finance. As we saw in the case of Deputy Governor Baumia, now Vice President Baumia, Governor Isahaku, Charlotte Osei, the force of the executive can force you out even when you have security of tenor. Either way, the president has everyone 
in his hands. He has a good hold on everyone. The president, in effect, shapes the tune in the exercise of values, the freedom, property, justice, and accountability that the Constitution talks about. We all follow the character of that president. So needless to say, our Constitution has created in a president, for want of a better expression, a democratic dictator. Respectfully, the, one of the crafters of the Constitution, and I see my very good friend and uncle, uh, Kwesi Boche here, Dr. Kwesi Boche here, uh, I'm sure you were looking at it at some point. So, I mean, the crafters may have considered this structure necessary for a smooth transition from the military rule to the democracy we have. But it has now become the bedrock of our problems, an ever-powerful president. <coughs> this structure has created a winner-takes-all system that has ensured an adversarial democracy, an unending NDC versus MPP war, and not a consensual democracy. It empowers the executive to exclude anyone at will from fair access or include anyone for biased access to public services and opportunities. It has made it possible for the executive to unfairly utilize the powers of the state against any adversary it identifies. At a minimum, we have the perception. With so much power in one arm of government, Lord Acton's views come to play. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> Hence, meritocracy and institutional development has now given way to political fanaticism and social corruption. With the stakes so high, party financing has become an unending entrepreneurial investment. In hope, not for the advancement of a philosophical principle for development, but rather opportunity to be included in the economic discretion of the executive and opportunities to also plunder the state. Party financing is high risk. As a finance man, I can tell you, the high risk investments are designed to yield high returns. So question, who will pay the premium? We don't do regular returns with party financing. High risk, high return. Who will pay the premium? Your guess is as good as mine. It's you and me. If in doubt, ask successive governments why they have had so much inertia in pursuing and prosecuting corporates of the billions of cities in petroleum revenue and in other sectors. It is simple. Doing so it means you're going after your financiers, your party faithfuls, and sometimes your party leaders. Distinguished guests, the truth that has to be told is this. Corruption is the currency for our democracy. The excessive power of the presidency has created a public space and political environment of yes men. You are cautious not to do otherwise, else your place will be lost. You know, just record the tsunami in our ministries every time there's a change of government. MPP leaves, NDC comes, NDC leaves, MPP. Look at the tsunami there. If a chief director's office is now tied to the fortunes of the party in government, where on earth will, will, his, will his allegiance be? The executive or the constitution? In effect, the power of the executive is imprisoning our public institutions. It has the power of the, of the executive is imprisoning our constitutions. It has cowed even the private sector, who remain cautious of the capacity of the presidency and its pol political henchmen to negatively impact their businesses through regulatory bodies, government agencies, and negative bias in the access to public services and government procurement. As a result, the former private sector is wary to, is, is wary to, to be seen as associated with an opposing political party personality. Simply put, when you are a politically exposed person in opposition, businesses will shy away from you. They will hardly employ you, engage you on their boards, or offer you a role as a vendor. Prof, I see you, but I can't put you on my board. Oh. Professor Alabi, I'm sorry. I can see you in chambers and take your advice. Uncle Che, when you retire, oh, I'll visit you at home and I'll take your advice over our whiskey. But I can't put you on my board if NDC is in office. That is the reality of our time. I'd ask this question. 
Will we see Gabi Ochidakon being offered a legal job by, by the NDC when they are in government? Or our very fine Maria Chabru, fine former attorney general, offered legal contracts under the MPP? Do you think it's going to happen? She did a great job with our, with our uh, maritime thing. Nobody renewed anything with the new problems we have. It won't happen. That democracy we haven't built yet. This makes the economic survival of a politician highly risky. Lose your job while in office, while your party is in office, and you are close to doomed. Have your party out of office, then you are doomed. How do you survive beyond politics when your salary as a politician barely covers your personal expenses? Corruption, corruption, corruption. Ministers and MPs take home a salary of about 12,500 to 15,000 cities net after statutory deductions, vehicle deductions, court cost deduction. You have to pay party, regional, and constituency as well every month. <laughs> when you see your ministers, pray for them. Your MPs, pray for them. It's not easy. From this balance that I mentioned, they have to pay their driver. They may pay their rent and mod or mortgage, fend for their families. Have you wondered how they are able to fund the many food soldier and community demands on them, including school fees, funerals, church harvest, festivals, etc.? Have you given them money to go and pay? Have you wondered how some of our ministers and MPs suddenly are able to afford to move their kids to high-end private international schools, quickly building and acquiring various houses and properties, and funding travels for their families and other significant associates? I didn't say side checks. Significant associates. <laughs> what politicians sometimes forget is that the people knew them and their lifestyle prior to assuming office. Why a sudden change after an appointment or election? This unexplained wealth and changes in lifestyles have been less relevant to the taxman. And it's simple. The political class controls the taxman. They are more interested in people like me, the private people. And my chairman, Ivy, Apia Usu, they will come for us. MPP will hesitate to go after the NDC officials on unexplained wealth because there is a silent understanding of live and let us live. It is the way they sustain themselves and the democracy that we adore. So please, do not be fooled. Under this constitution, corruption is going nowhere. It is what keeps the wheels of democracy moving currency for our democracy. It is no wonder that corruption perception index has grown from 33.98 to 43 in 2020. Actually hit 47 at some point. The last Afrobarometer for 2019 reported 53% of the population believing corruption increased in the previous year. To make matters worse, and this is the most frightening for me, over 80% of respondents believe that all three arms of government are totally or partly corrupt. This is even more dangerous, especially when the judiciary that, the, when, when the judiciary is seen equally as corrupt as the other two arms of government. The perception that the justice, justice is no more in knowing the law, but knowing the judge should frighten everybody. Whether it is true or not, this data reflects the perception. I raise these questions on corruption so passionately because it is a major driver in the depletion of hope that the promise of the Constitution will be delivered. It is the easiest and most resounding excuse to justify the toppling of constitutions, especially when faith in the judiciary and accountability institutions wins so badly. Corruption is so elegant a name, but it must be reduced to what it is, stealing, theft. To relate to corruption, one must picture the life of a sachet water hawker. She's running back and forth to make the minimum wage she needs to sell about 200 sachets, sachet, sachets of water. If she has two children, what it means is that if you steal one million, you are robbing the livelihood of 240,000 people. I must admit, we have largely lost our values as a people. Empathy for one another has become rare. And as the guns will say, Anna Momobo. Corruption is not simply a financial loss to Ghana. It is the theft of livelihoods. It is the destruction of the future, 
of real lives. It is the perpetuation of hopelessness. It is the trade-off with that hospital that should have saved Mrs. Ubri Yeboa earlier this year after her caesarean section at the secondary Takradi Hospital. It comes at the expense of little Komla Foley's quality education and his chance to compete with the world in the next 10 years. It is the trade-off with the road network and infrastructure that will propel private sector jobs and give Wumbe in Yendi the dignity of employment and his hope to marry someday. But we sometimes forget that the common denominator of, 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 of corruption is us, the citizenry. We have equally lost our values and sometimes suggest that politicians come from space. They are our siblings, our congregants, uncles, and neighbors. They actually reflect who we are. Citizens demand all kinds of things from our party politicians, which we are aware they cannot sustain by their legitimate income. When your man is there and your uncle is minister, you want him or her to fix you somewhere. If they don't fix you and they say go through the process, you call the person bad. Auntie, my auntie Eli has been called bad by the family people plenty of times. <laughs> She's straight as the word. You end your place. Corruption used to be in the single delegate of thousands of dollars. Now we are talking millions. It is getting worse and will only be worse with every change in government. What on earth do you expect? Take your time and look at this one. What do you expect if the politically and economically alienated people under the current government take over the reins in 2025? People have been hungry for long ago. They will recover the lost years and store for the next unforeseeable years. And I'm not just talking about an opposition like the NDC right now. Even within a ruling government, there are politically alienated people. I call them internally displaced politicians. <laughs> Either way, corruption is going nowhere. It will only grow bigger and threaten bigger and more our democracy. That is what we have created. I am certain that while as citizens we may have failed, we have been molded by the operation of the 1992 Constitution. That so heavily depends on the goodness of the heart of man. That goodness of heart of man is rare today. We can't have a constitution built on the goodness of a heart of man. So the question, what constitution do we need? Ironically, the superintending midwife of the 1992 constitution, Flat Left and Rollins, gives us the best answer. But I'll quote, we can vote personalities in and out. What we need to do is to establish a situation where even if it were the devil who should come and sit on top of us in Ghana, by virtue of certain procedures and certain practices, the devil can never get away with doing what he wants. He will necessarily do what the people expect of him." End quote. Unfortunately, the man himself did not give us that. I heard that. <laughs> but I absolutely agree with his recommendation. We must limit the dependence on the integrity and personality of our leadership. And just as Barack Obama said, Africa doesn't need strong men, it needs strong institutions, end quote. It is so admirable when you see Australia's political class in disarray, and yet having no impact on the delivery of public services and economic uh, prosperity at all. They can fight, the life is going on. You entertain a presidential election petition in Ghana, and the whole public service will slip into coma. This is not a town where institutions work. So today I propose to you a new democracy. A democracy, a Ghanacracy, a consensual democracy, not an adversarial democracy. A democracy of a loser wins some, and not a winner takes all. A democracy that makes politics a call and moment of service and not a career of total economic dependence. A democracy that promotes the strengthening of our institutions and reflects the inclusiveness of our professionals and people. A democracy in which being out of government means nothing to your economic sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, a democracy that promotes meritocracy. This, I believe, may require three broad interventions to enable us avoid the risk of death of our constitution. These recommendations are not thought of as sacrosanct. They are aimed at provoking thoughts and debate on options to develop the democracy we need. A, an urgent constitutional reform. 
to reflect the democracy we need, a consensual democracy. B, establishment and management of a bipartisan economic and national economic development agenda, something owned by everybody. And C, the reconscientization of the Ghanaian and the values needed for our social and economic transformation. On the constitutional reform, a few things here. I recommend something I call the 7D reform, some of which are covered in various forms in the Constitutional Review Commission report of 2011. So one, we need to deepen the separation of powers between the three arms of government. Two, depoliticize our governance and democratic institutions. Three, depoliticize our security services, depoliticize our accountability institutions, depoliticize all state agencies, including SOEs, regulatory bodies, and agencies. Six, democratize our MMDAs, and seven, democracy funding, which would be the sticky one. So I touch on these seven days quite quickly. On the deepening of the separation of powers, we have these three arms. We need to break that link, as described earlier. So with the, with the legislature, we need to expunge the full separation, of the, the expunge any requirement or option for the executive to appoint any member of the legislature. There should be no option at all as a minister or member of a board of the enterprises and agencies of the state. You can't be a player and referee at the same time. Stay in your lane. The next one we have to work on is the judiciary. To entrench the independence of the judiciary from the executive, the authority to appoint members of the judicial council of the judiciary from the lower courts to the appeals court must be made the exclusive preserve of the judicial council, which should be required to adopt an open and public evaluation process. The nominations to Supreme Court and for the Chief Justice should equally emanate from the judicial council but subject to the approval of two thirds of members in parliament. They have to agree and own the confidence in our Supreme Court judges together. It will also disincentivize potential political activism that is at the bench, a situation that's eroding confidence in the judiciary and the very core values, freedom and justice. We don't need judges to want to catch the eye of any president anymore. But that will also require that we have a revision to the constitution of the Judicial Council itself. If you look at it well, there are a lot more people the president directly and, and, and indirectly influence. So that has to change. We will need to create room for the opposition to also have nominations on this, on this council. It is a center of our democracy. We have to move and have a lot more technocratic representation, independent technocratic representations on our Judiciary, on our Judicial Council. Then the next D is the depoliticization of our governance and democratic institutions. A very interesting one here. These include NCCE, EC, NMC. They are called to the sustenance of our democracy. The management of the appointment of the Electoral Commission has in recent times been fraught with so much mistrust and political polarization. The poor consultative process in the appointment of Charlotte Osei in the, and the infamous maneuvering to oust her, and the equally non-consensual process in appointing Jean Mensa do not augur well for our democratic stability. I shudder to think of what the NDC will do should they assume office with Jean Mensa in office. <laughs> this tells us that the system is sick, and it is not working for we the people. So I recommend a more consensual process. Thus, I still have the president nominate commissioners for the approval of parliament by two thirds majority. I also believe our constitution should place a demand on the presidency to adopt an open and public process requiring a recruitment process that includes interested persons to apply. The demand for two thirds majority shall significantly ensure a process owned by the key political parties and shall eliminate potential partisan activism from aspiring commissioners. If you see Jean Mensa today respectfully, I see it and it's quite pathetic. She has to move everywhere with military people. Why? The steady depoliticize our security services. Similar to the above processes, the president's nominees should also be subject to two thirds approval from par parliament. It is also to mitigate political activism in the military. 
and the culture of protocol, protocol placements in the military, in the police, and then the other, other security services. We need to have them have some finite and secure term. You see that in the US. You have a four term. So the current chairman of the Joint Chiefs is an appointee, was nominated by Trump. There's no problem in America. The antenna must straddle also between two administrations. Some may argue that the security services are too sensitive and must be left to the president alone. I can relate to the concern, but allegiance sworn to the constitution and, and commitment must be to the people of Ghana and none other. So find your person. <laughs> find your person through the ranks. Come for all of us to agree and then we run our country. We definitely need system to keep the growing political polarization in our security services. My fourth D, depoliticize our accountability institutions. The Office of the Attorney General should also be separate from the executive and made totally independent. The authority to nominate the Attorney General and the commissioners of Shraj and the OSP should also be now made the exclusive preserve of the General Legal Council. And they too would have to be to adopt an open and public evaluation process. You want to do the job, apply for it. We should interview you, live TV. If you are not up to it, everybody will see. The GSLC as well will also have to be reconstituted to allow the opposition to also have space in there and make it more technocratic. And the technocrats, technocratic institutions and independent institutions should dominate the GLC as well. Then the Audit Service Board. Okay. Then the Audit Service Board should also be reconstituted and dominated by representatives of relevant professional institutions, like the Chartered Accountants Institute, Institute of Bankers, Ghana Bar Association, and others that we may find relevant. Nominees from the presidency should also be there, but also nominees from the opposition. These are the areas that are core to our democracy. Create a balance there. And let the board, through an open process, appoint their own Auditor General, also subject to two-thirds approval by Parliament. I recognize the potential for gridlock in the implementation of some of these requirements that I recommend with the two-thirds majority approval. Uh, but I believe as we debate and evaluate the options, we should be able to structure some fallback mechanisms on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. The sixth E is depolitizing our state agencies. So we should now also have technocratic institutions, representations and nominations from everyone, Sim I mean, similar structure. But this time, then the board themselves also appoint their CEOs. There's no two test majority in this matter. So let it run professional. So when I'm out of government, I know that the MD at MPA or, or the CEO at MPA has no business trying to victimize me or anything. I feel safe. I can go back to my regular life. As a contractor, I can go back and get a contract from GHA because I have the best bid, all right? Not because I have to know somebody or somebody's blacklisting me because I am a former MP. The fifth D is democratizing, sixth D is democratizing our MMDAs. I think the jury is out on this one. If democracy is a government by the people and for the people, there is no reason why there is no practice of it where governance is closest to the people. The MMDC elections must happen and happen now. 76% of Ghanaians in a recent survey by CDD have demanded it and it must be given to them. Partisan politics, I think the jury is out on that one too. The answer is a resounding no partisan politics. Over 71 Ghanaians, percent of, of Ghanaians in the survey say no politics and it must remain so. We need a new breath of fresh air from the overbearing cloud and weight of partisan politics that is eroding the independence of our leaders. Allow us to vote for our persons in their person and hold them personally accountable for their service. We do, <laughs> we do not want mayors voted by us and owned by parties whose directing minds are outside of our communities. I think it's only fair. So if I may borrow IC quiz words, on this matter, Agbena, any government Confident in the support of its people would make this debate the least of its worry. The beauty of all this is that delivering on this cry by the people is so simple and costs close to nothing. 
It requires a simple two-thirds majority in parliament. We say we are broke, and yet we are desperate to send, to run a spend on a referendum just so that political parties can retain hold over the MMDCs. Why? This is unconscionable, and I can't call it anything else but political greed and pejorative to us, to the reasoning of us, the people. So to ensure the independence of our MMDCs, we also need to have the independence of the District Assembly Common Fund. And in a similar consensus process, make sure we appoint them, also approved to test by, by, the, by the government. Then the last D is democracy funding. We claim to love democracy, but we shy away from funding it. We when we fail to fund our democracy, this is the fact, we are failing to own it. As noted earlier, party financing is the root of corruption and the plundering of the state. The role of a politician is so critical for the sustenance of a sovereign. It is a job that somebody must do. We all need to be led. I have to rush through. I'm being given signals I have to end. It's a job that we, somebody must do. Just as a headless goat is a dead goat, so is it that a politicianless state is a dead state. Our parties are arrowheads of our democracy. They are drivers of the policies and decisions that bring life to our democracy and the fuller lives that we desire. They must be well resourced to competently shape the development of our country. They must cease being election machines and become drivers of policy development and management. If we truly love our democracy, then we must put our money where our mouth is. If we leave the financing of our parties to business persons, we will be left with no option than to expect more plundering with impunity. Maybe we should be considering the establishment of a democracy fund to fund the activities of our political parties. The funding arrangement for the parties must be accompanied with restrictions on campaign financing. The profligacy must stop and must be effectively monitored by the Electoral Commission. We must also introduce stringent and public accountability system to ensure proper compliance with said rules. Corruption in Ghana, according to Imani, it's good that Franklin Kujo is here, is estimated at $3 billion a year. If we work to eliminate corruption and commit 20, 30% of this saving to the fund, Ghana will be better off. Funding may be by a set allocation from all the domestic revenue due the states, or the introduction of what now may be sticky now, a democracy tax. Either way, ladies and gentlemen, we must pay for the democracy we want. Funding our democracy through a democracy fund will make us better people, sustaining good values and building an honest economy. If we decide not to fund it, we will still end up funding it anyway, but really dearly. But this time, it will be true corruption, which destroys our value systems and threatens the democracy we have worked so hard to develop. As a matter of fact, like I said, it will cost us more if we don't fund it ourselves. So if I may be biblical, choose this day how you may want to pay for your democracy. Millions by democracy fund or billions by corruption. Choose. The democracy fund may be merged with the independent constitutional bodies fund proposed by the CRC report. I however recommend that the inclusion of the judiciary also in this um, ICB, ICB fund they also don't need to depend on the executive so much on their peers. I also recommend that the administrators should also be subject to two-thirds majority because it's a very sensitive part and we need to have consensus on who is there. The second broad theme, and I'm wrapping up in five minutes, is the development of a bipartisan agenda, economic agenda. The CRC report effectively captures the consensus that the people want on the development agenda. It captures the need for an independent NDPC, driven by the principles of state policy, directive principles of state policy. I agree with the recommendation, recommendations of, of um, the CRC report for a more technocratic NDPC. However, I must add that we must, in addition, have an annual public evaluation of every ruling party's conformity and performance with the new development plan, so we are sure 
that if you voted you on, you're actually delivering the plan. The last broad theme is the reconscientization of the people of Ghana. Biral Ambekda said this, I quote, however good a constitution may be, if those who are implementing it are not good, it will prove to be bad. However bad a constitution may be, if those implementing it are good, it will prove to be good, unquote. Nelson Mandela also said this, I quote, permanent values in social life cannot be created by people who are indifferent or hostile to the aspirations of a nation, end quote. Simply put, we cannot get the best of any constitution with the people without the right values. Our value system needs a total overhaul to promote patriotism, honest work, meritocracy, of course, integrity, empathy, and service, and absolutely the lead values stated in our constitution, freedom, justice, probity, accountability, and unity. If we envision a future of phenomenal transformation of our country, then active citizenship through civic education cannot be ignored. To this end, Madam, I'm going to talk some more for you. We ought to resource the NCCE to develop and execute a program for national value transformation and constitution education in participation with all the key stakeholders. Like Singapore, these values must run through our education system as a subject from kindergarten all through to the tertiary education. Distinguished guests, these three broad recommendations, inclusive of the 7D sub recommendations, reform sub recommendations, are not to replace the CRC report, but they are just to augment them where applicable. Needless to say, it is time for us to bring the CRC report back to the front banner, revise it where necessary, and deepen our democracy to deliver the blessings of the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, People of Ghana, the future is the future of our youth. Our children today and generations unborn. Movements every step of our way should drive a better world for them. I have not come to spew doom, but to awaken our consciences to the fact that our stability ought not be taken for granted. We must guard it so jealously and and, and that requires us to be responsive and futuristic in our adaptations to the evolving cultural and developmental needs of our time and our people. It is time for us to abandon adversarial democracy and embark on a consensual democracy. The hungry youth cannot wait any longer for us to deliver our, the blessings that the Constitution has promised them. They can't wait. So we either evolve or be dissolved. Ladies and gentlemen, the clock is ticking. My mouth has fallen. God bless our homeland. God.